Hi, I'm Dr. Andrew Bletcher, and I specialize in sports medicine at the Southern California Orthopedic Institute. And I'm here today with retired NFL Pro Bowler Robert Griffith from the Minnesota Vikings to talk about football, concussions, and the risk of long-term brain injuries. Hi, I'm Robert Griffith, and from my 13 years playing in NFL and six years as an executive member of the NFL Players Association, I can tell you that I witnessed firsthand the dangers of football and the risk of concussions and traumatic brain injuries. I was very lucky to survive a long football playing career without a significant brain injury. But many of my fellow players have not been so lucky. We have now seen thousands of players enter the litigation due to head injuries they sustain from playing football at all levels of the game. These dangers are real and that is why I have launched a project to develop new headgear hopefully to not only reduce the effects of these impacts but also provide new data to help learn more about what we can do to prevent them. To understand more about this, let's first start by taking a quick look at how concussions happen. When Robert played as a safety, he would accelerate up to speed, and as he is running, his brain is also moving down the field rapidly. But as soon as he hits the opposing player to make a tackle, his head decelerates rapidly as he comes to a stop. The same thing happens to the opposing player as well. If their heads were to collide, their helmets would protect them from fracturing their skulls. But the brain is still moving inside as the head comes to a sudden stop, and ultimately will rattle around inside the skull. This is similar to an egg yolk rattling around inside the eggshell if you were to shake it. So even though he has a helmet on, his brain isn't protected from the acceleration and deceleration and rotational forces occurring inside the skull. These g-forces to the brain are what cause concussions, and that is why helmets do not protect against concussions. So if I was constantly making tackles like this, then wasn't I always giving myself a concussion on every hit? That's a great question, Robert. The answer is that probably you were able to anticipate the impact as you saw you were about to make the hit, and you contracted your neck muscles to help stabilize and protect your head and reduce the g-forces on your brain. We still don't yet know whether it is more the direct impacts or rotational forces that do more damage, but oftentimes it is the hit that you don't see coming that does the most damage. These blindsided hits oftentimes result in concussions and may lead to symptoms such as loss of consciousness, confusion, memory loss, dizziness, nausea, and headache, among others. So if I never had one of these blindsided hits or experienced any of these severe symptoms, does that mean that my brain was safe? Unfortunately, it doesn't. We are now learning more and more about what we call subconcussive blows. These are the hits that you do see coming and you prepare for, and they don't end up causing symptoms, and therefore are below the threshold for what we would diagnose as a concussion. But just because these hits don't cause a concussion or lead to a functional brain injury with symptoms that we can see, that doesn't mean that they still don't cause injury at the microscopic pathologic level. Hold on, wait, but wait a second. Now you're talking to me about the hits that occur almost in every play of every game. Just look at all the head contact that occurs on the routine play at the line of scrimmage. That's right, Robert. Each of these hits produces G-forces on the brain that may not be enough to cause a concussion, but still might be doing damage pathologically. Let's take a look at this graph, which gives us an idea of the forces on the brain that may occur over a football season. We easily recognize the spike in g-forces that occurs if there is a big hit, especially one big enough to cause a concussion. The area under this graph would be the total volume of head trauma over the course of the season. But now let's look at a graph which includes all the less forceful subconcussive blows that occur, as you say, on almost every play of every game. Although there are no large spikes from concussions, you can see that the overall volume of head trauma is greater. Put the two graphs together, and you get the real picture of what occurs over a football season. It is this total volume of head trauma that is most likely responsible for leading to CTE, or chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And that's why we see CTE or other cognitive changes, even in younger people, without a history of having many concussions. This is definitely what scares me the most. So what can we do to prevent it? Well, the only absolute way to prevent it would be not to play a collision sport like football in the first place. But assuming that that isn't an option for you, there are several things you can do to help try and properly manage and minimize the effects of these brain injuries. My first recommendation would be to get a baseline test, 
whether you do computerized neuropsych testing, such as we do here at SCOE, or even something simple, such as SCAT testing, balance testing, or the King-Devic test, it is important to get a baseline of your brain functioning to use as a basis of comparison to be tested again if you need to be evaluated for a concussion or brain injury. My second recommendation would be to work on a neck strengthening program and make sure you work on your tackling technique. The more you can keep your head out of contact or even reduce the impact with neck strengthening and positioning, the better off you will be. Thirdly, try to keep the overall contact to a minimum by limiting the amount of hitting that goes on in practice. Teams at all levels are moving towards less hitting drills and less full contact practices. The less exposure there is to collisions, the more you are reducing that total volume of head trauma. Some are even suggesting hit counts similar to pitch counts used to protect pitchers' arms in baseball. My final recommendation is that when a concussion does occur, we need to make absolutely sure that we are managing it properly. That's why I believe that there should be a certified athletic trainer or other medical personnel trained in concussions available at every single practice and every single game at all levels of play, not just college and the pros, but high school down to peewee football. If we are going to put kids at risk of brain injury playing a sport, then it is vitally important that we have professionals on hand to evaluate them so that if and when head injuries do occur, they are managed correctly to protect against doing further damage. What about the equipment? How important is the equipment? Right now, there is no helmet out there that can protect against concussion or CTE. And that's why the work that you are doing is so vitally important. We need to figure out better ideas and materials to reduce these G-forces on the brain. And more importantly, we need to get more data to better understand the exact how, when, and why concussions are occurring, sometimes, but not others. Please keep up the great work, Robert. And thank you so much for joining me here today to discuss this very important topic. Absolutely. My pleasure.